you, we are recording. I really appreciate the, the, you coming on. I know it was Steve that uh, passed me on your your number from Kendall, and obviously that's where you might not remember because um, let's say, what, can we say star of the show at Kendall? You were surrounded by people when I when I met you on the final day. Um, but what a time that was in November. Good memories from uh, from November and the Kendall Mountain Festival. Yeah, it's always a blast. It's uh, it's a real privilege to be involved with it and see it evolve and develop from what was a relatively small event 20 years ago to uh to what's a massive event now right yeah and have you so 20 years have you been there right from the start right from um the get-go yeah, pretty much yeah 1999 was the was the reawakening it actually started back in 1980 um and they did a few iterations of it back then which was the year i was born uh-huh. So obviously I wasn't at those ones, uh, but yeah, I've missed a few of them usually because I'm on an expedition, but it's uh, it's a blast. Well, what was it like, obviously, with the, all the, the films and the expeditions that you've been on, but to have somewhere that's so close to home that you can premiere these videos and you can you can get into, that was my first time at Kendall, and to, to, to see just how many people are there, all with the same attitude, all with the same mindset of adventure and conversation and whether it be books or movies, what's it like to you to be so close to home, but to show people what you're out there doing? Well, it's a bit random, to be honest, because there's not a lot goes on in Kendall. You know, it's <laughs> uh, it's pretty quiet most of the year. Uh, and then it just so happens that nowadays, um, you know, the third weekend of November, which is usually a pretty crap time in the Lake District, it's like in between seasons, right? It's uh, it's usually pretty, um, pretty minging. Uh, there's this massive international event, which I'm the patron of. And it's literally five minutes from my house. And like you say, I've had quite a lot of films there over the years this year I had my first book um so it's pretty random basically because you know I go to events like that all over the world Kendall's definitely one of the biggest now uh up there with you know like Banff and a few other other really big mountain festivals um but it's great fun I just I wish we had more events like that I, I don't go out much anymore I've, I've got two little kids and uh, and I still do a lot of big missions so it's uh, it's a bit rowdy. I think I was out five nights in a row this year. It took me about two weeks to recover. When you texted me saying, um, Nashi, can we do it a bit later at 9 p.m.? I was like, that's dad talking. He knows he's got to do bedtime, get the kids to sleep. And I'm exactly the same. My three are hopefully asleep now. But sometimes I'll sneak in at six o'clock or something a bit early evening. When you said nine o'clock, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. You know what it's like when the, they start bouncing off you and... Uh, it's good fun, right? But it's hard to concentrate. Well, it's, it's hard to get anything done. It's hard to, you just, I'm constantly picking things up, wiping things. And, you know, my wife's shouting at me as well because I make just as much mess. You, you know what it's like. You I know do. It's like. Book tour, obviously, you were, you were all over the country. What was that process like, putting things into print? Because obviously so many films and expeditions that way, but with Closer to the Edge, what was that journey like for you? uh to be honest i hated it <laughs> yeah it was uh, <laughs> it was a nightmare um because the yeah I, d- I didn't know where to start you know trying to to put a, a lifetime's experience into uh into a hundred thousand words or so which sounds like a lot but it's really not that's twenty five thousand word chapters and you know every time i write an expedition report um it's about five thousand words and that's from a single you know, six weeks trip or something. So trying to fit it all in and what to include or more difficult still, what to miss out um, w- was a bit of a nightmare. And then, you know, I, I, I've written a bit over the years. I can do it. Um, and it's something I've always wanted to do was to write it myself with certainly not with a ghostwriter and not with too much editing. I kind of wanted to, uh, if, you know, if you get, if, I, if it gets too edited, it kind of, it's no longer your own words. Um, but then trying to like, actually do it and um you know figure out how to construct a a narrative which is both honest and and truthful there's so much bullshit when people write books and spinned versions of truths um everyone does it from the most famous to the least (laughs) but i didn't really want to do that because you know particularly within rock climbing there's a very high level of integrity it's really important not to to spin and bend truths and delve too much into gray areas we have a lot of integrity much more than most other sports in my opinion partly because you know you have to come back and you're as good as your word people have to be honest and truthful and tell the whole truth but the problem is if you do that in a in a narrative form it starts to get boring you you know a book's not a report it's 
it's got to be pacey, it's got to be exciting, it's got to have ups and downs, it's got to have that um, narrative arc. Anyway, so it was a bit of a nightmare, and then it was a bit of a, a mad panic. I had a year to do it, and uh, it was with a big publisher. It wasn't kind of a, a boutique sort of outdoorsy publisher. It was a big mainstream publisher, so you've got a bit of a battle there to, you know, how technical does it need to be, how how generic does it need to be, and obviously I want people outside the uh, the genre to read it, but it needs to hold its own in the for the for the climbers as well. So yeah, I'm glad it's done. Because <laughs> I, I expect when you go on an expedition, you're wanting it to run as smoothly as possible. But when you're writing a book, you need to, like you mentioned there, you need to have the excitement or the this is where disaster struck and this is how we recovered. We were you able to sort of draw on a few, obviously, so many expeditions, and we'll touch on a, a few of them hopefully. But were you able to draw on some that w- went really smoothly, A to B, absolutely fine? You got to the summit, but others were disaster struck or, you know, the panic set in. Well, the big expeditions were really only the last part of the book because it's it's an autobiography, right? So it's uh, it's my life up to this point. I'm 42 now, and there's really there's three sections in the book. It's called First Times big times uh sorry first times wild times big times um and uh and so it's like right from the beginning of of what were the most influential people and places and things and events that that put you on this path and sort of the last part of the book is the one that's probably most in the public domain the 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 bigger expeditions all the films and stuff um uh, the feedback I'm getting now is that people are really enjoying the first part, which is the uh, basically the first 18 years, what what got you onto the path. Um, anyway, it's, it's been well received. Uh, people seem to be enjoying it. Apparently, it's quite a page turner. So I'm, I'm really glad I did it. It's something I really wanted to do. I wouldn't rule out doing another, but I, I'd, I'd be lying if I said uh, I enjoyed the process. Just put more pictures in the next one. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> the uh, It's a pretty traditional... Um, you know the hardbacks out now the paperbacks coming out in about six months uh, and there aren't that many photos that was the other challenge was I think there's 38 photos or something uh, I did a first pass through my archive and you know there was over 150 and how do you get it down to 38 just you know the classic like couple of sections of, of photos but yeah I might if, if I do another book I might do one with a bit more uh, imagery in it. See, see when you touch on there when you when you started and what set you on the path uh, listening to you on podcasts and knowing a bit of your story, obviously sent off on the train, sent off to your mate's house as, as a young boy, as a young man, you know, do you think, how do you think your career would flow if you were born now where as parents, it's certainly not the done thing to just send your kids out and go to a different city, get on the train, go and climb those rocks. Certainly a bit, you'd say more relaxed when we were kids in the great outdoors. And to I mean, to be honest, walk, it wasn't, walk. it wasn't really the done thing back then either, especially not with, uh, with, you know, I think I was 13 the first time I got on a train and went to the Peak District by myself. Um, so, yeah, what you're saying is, is definitely true. It's probably even less common now, but none of my mates were doing that. You know, it wasn't that usual back then. I think um, my parents were were pretty liberal. I was also so very, very independent um, right from the word go, really. Uh, my mum tells a story of uh, I didn't even want her to walk me to school on the first day of school when I was four <laughs> it was just up the road you know we lived in a little village but I was insistent that I was going by myself so um so that combination of a, a fierce independent spirit and and pretty laid-back liberal parents um you know they knew what they were doing they were they were they were giving me opportunities uh my sister who's a fair bit older she w- were quite different she would never have wanted to uh to to travel independently when she was a teenager and she probably wouldn't have been allowed to um, I think more though, you know, it, my my t- timing was good in my life. I kind of, uh, I feel like I was really lucky with, uh, you know, being born in 1980. They, there was a, a generation of professional climbers before me, you know, Jerry Moffat, Ben Moon, John Barker, Ron Kauk. Um, but that was really the first generation of people who were actually able to make a living out of, uh, of just climbing at a high level and not doing other stuff. Um, but there weren't very many of them at all. And, you know, those handful of characters really were the, the best rock climbers in the world. And then a bit later, and certainly now, it's changed so much. You know, this it's so much more professional now. The standards are so much higher. It's so much more serious. And then you've got the whole social media element and the, 
the whole kind of always on um, non-stop feed. I, I, I remember when you do something and, you know, you get some photos and it'd be a month before you even got the, the slides developed, you know, <laughs> it was, yeah. uh, whereas now it's like, if it's, if everybody doesn't know by the end of the day, you've kind of missed the boat. That's it. Like if people looked at my Instagram with my kids and everything we do, they would see beach walks and jumping in the sea, wetsuits and all these sorts of things. And we think we're quite an outdoorsy family. When I look at your Instagram and what you're doing with your kids, obviously they couldn't be safer with, with someone of your experience, but was that ever in doubt the way you would travel with your kids and the, the, what you do with them on with, uh, forgive me, Jackson on your back and Freya behind you on a rope scaling these peaks because I'm inspired by it to try and push my kids to do more. I don't have the experience of the skill that you do. So I, there's certain levels that I can take it to. What you've exposed your kids to so young is incredible. Well, you know, we, uh, we do a lot of stuff as a family, just like, you know, we're, um, and on a low level, we live, we live in the Lake District. So we're out, out most weekends, either biking or hiking or scrambling or climbing or paddle boarding or, or doing something. Um, then on trips, particularly summer holidays, we, we started doing some like bigger stuff. And when the kids were pretty little, we, uh, we sort of slowly realized that actually uh, we could do a lot more with little kids than we anticipated. My wife and I always did a lot of adventures together, a lot of big climbs before the kids came along. And then when they came along, obviously it curtails it a little bit, but um, actually my wife was as, as much up for it as I was. And, you know, we didn't really want to palm the kids off with the grandparents or, you know, which is hard to do on a, on a long summer trip anyway. We, we wanted to get back into the mountains and do some proper stuff. And we had a good system for carrying the, the little ones with this really neat carrier. It's called an Ergo Baby. It's not one of those big carriers with a frame that I think are rubbish that keep the kid miles away from your back and they're really unwieldy. It's almost a sling harness, but as a rucksack, so the child's right against you. It's a really minimalist little thing, uh, but they keep warm and, and, it, and it makes them a manageable load. Uh, and we started sort of experimenting with scrambles, via ferratas, some bigger stuff and it worked really well you know the kids were into it my little girl Freya has always been uh, extremely good on her feet when she was four she was doing you know 1500 meters of ascent big big days out and then gradually we kept turning the dial and you know we have done some pretty spectacular stuff like big alpine rock climbs with with little kids and uh, it's pretty impressive you know it's been a surprise to me what <laughs> they've been capable of and what you can do as a family with you know a manageable level of control and it, it's pretty cool I think it's amazing that you can go and do these big adventures with little kids it's very cool but dad to dad you've got to tell me that sometimes they're screaming and they don't want to get out of the car or they're not interested yeah of course there is you know but that <laughs> people often say how the heck do you get these kids on those big adventures well I, I, I don't know about you, but everything's pretty epic with kids. You know, I find it difficult just getting them ready to go to school every morning. There's always kicking and fighting and screaming and getting the teeth brushed. And uh, and then definitely when we get outside, especially if the weather's not that agreeable, it, it's the first hour um, is the challenge, you know, even the first half hour. But generally, it's about an hour until, until you can get them going and you get into it and uh, but then once you get them going, you know, as long as you keep them fueled up and uh, and keep it fun, yeah. you can keep going um, for for hours and days and thousands of meters. And uh, yeah, we've done some some really fun stuff. And I actually find that the bigger expeditions, the bigger missions with the kids, um, it's almost easier because you you kind of like really settle into into the flow, you know, into the the um, the vibe of like a proper mission when you've got a clear purpose and getting out the house is the hardest bit once you once you get onto the trail and into the mountains uh it's it's a bit more um sort of uh flowing is there a holding a traditional treat for a summit is there something you always take to celebrate at the top or is it different every time uh to be honest we've sort of eased off a bit on the treats because um we still bring them but they uh it started the adventures became about the treats and the kids were just started nagging to get sweets the whole time. And, sure. uh, and so we went, we went the opposite way. We went for a full ban and, you know, cause they, yeah, they work, the bribes work, but when it becomes more about the bribe than the adventure and the kids are just nagging the whole time for, 
another word is original, another Haribo. We're like, you know what? Screw that. We're, we're going to go cold turkey. We're not going to bring any, um, you know, just some fruit or something, which will keep them going. And, yeah. you know, we, we found a common ground now because, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not about the, uh, uh, all about the, the chocolate biscuits. How is it seeing these adventures through their eyes? Obviously, you know what I mean by that, because you've done unbelievable things and you'll be doing much easier things with the kids, but is it does it give you a new lease of life doing it with them, having them with you, having Freya charging up in front of you, you maybe having to chase after her to slow her down? Oh, definitely. You know, I think Jade is not the right word, but when you've uh, been so privileged to go on uh, so many big trips to faraway places and to, you know, have climbed some of the most impressive and spectacular, certainly in my mind, impressive and spectacular things in the world. Um, it, it does get quite hard to uh, to get that same reward, to get that same feeling of of awe, of, of majesty, of excitement. Um, so, but then when you bring the kids and, and you, you go somewhere really cool and you, you have a good experience, they get so excited by it and they're, uh, it's so easy to blow a child's mind and it's definitely infectious. You know, it's really easy to rediscover all those simple things and, uh, and I'm getting a huge kick out of it. And, and I can definitely say some of the, uh, the kids missions right up there with, um, with any of the, of the, the bigger expeditions and the summits in Antarctica or, you know, Everest or the, the, the crazy major cliffs are, uh, are no better than the uh, the family missions, which are relatively accessible. You know, they are quite full on things to do with little kids, but they're they're not kind of expeditions which cost a fortune to the ends of the earth. There, there are things that anyone who's who's a, a motivated climber could could feasibly go and do. Well, you, you touched on there. We'll move on to some of the expeditions you've done. The wildest dream in Everest. Can you take us there? Because obviously, with, with House of Gods and um, Spectre and everything that that I've seen of late. When I look back at Everest, could you tell me the, the story behind that and your reason for being on Everest? And well, that wasn't my project. You know, all the, yeah. uh, pretty much all the other films that I've made have been my uh, projects um, yeah. partnered with filmmakers. But the the Wildest Dream was a major IMAX movie. You know, it was a uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, major proper movie with uh, um, you know with a with a big crew and a big distribution uh, partnership. It was really Conrad Anker, the American mountaineer, was the um, was the driving force on, on the talent side, and then a guy called Anthony Geffan, who's um, who's a pretty big hitter in the in the UK independent movie scene, and um, and you know Conrad found Mallory's body, George Mallory's body, uh, eight thousand four hundred meters on Everest in nineteen ninety nine, and that reawakened popular interest in that epic tale of you know, Mallory and Irvin and their disappearance less than a thousand feet below the summit of Everest in, in 1924. This guy, Anthony Geffen, um, thought there was a, a really good film to be made in that story, started a dialogue with Conrad. And then uh, 2007, so eight years later, um, we went back to make a film. I got a call out the blue from Conrad one day in the in the winter of 2006, and he was just like, uh, I, I knew him from Yosemite. And he just said, "Hey Leo, you know, do you want to, do you want to climb Everest with me? We want to make a film. Do you want to be Irvin?" And it took me about two seconds to uh, <laughs> to agree. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of where that came from. So I was just a really a very small cog in a in a very big machine. And in some ways, I had one of the easiest, but also one of the uh, the best roles in that machine. Yeah, I mean. It epic it sounds it sounds fantastic and you moved ladders to scale faces and and all that sort of stuff is that right yeah well i say we but it, it wasn't really us you know there was um there was a we had a huge sherpa team led by this guy called ang ferber who at the time was probably one of the best high altitude mountaineers in the world certainly one of the most experienced um, guys in everest uh, and it was kind of a transition period it was it was right when the circus really came to town um on uh, on everest um and now all the other big mountains, uh, but it already was a, a circus. It just wasn't quite such a big one as it is now. Um, but it was those guys that uh, removed the ladders from the second step uh, the day before we went and and free climbed it without those ladders in place. It, it was a major logistical operation to to uh, manage the whole scene and bring you know movie cameras, IMAX movie cameras, digital ones, but nonetheless, um, you know, I think we had 75 kilos of camera equipment on the summit. 
and uh, and it was the the Sherpa team led by Ang Ferber, but there was there was twenty guys. Um, it was it was a major thing run by um, uh, a company called Himal- Himex Himalayan Experience, a guy called Russell Bryce that was kind of spinning all the plates in, in base camp to uh, to make it happen. And it was a real eye opening experience for me to to just see how those large scale um, expeditions work. And when you throw in the movie element, it's you know it kind of doubles the the, the complexity and the scale of everything. It's it's hard enough if you ever see a, a like a proper movie shoot. Um, or even a large scale like commercial or TV shoot at, at sea level on the ground. There's a bunch of people involved. It's like, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a major thing. And trying to do that, I mean, just trying to climb Everest without making a proper movie is, is, a, is an involved like logistical process. And bringing the, combining those two things is like a major undertaking. And it was, uh, it was something to behold. And what keeping sort of not movies, but just sort of TV and filming, what stage of your career was that? And then you had the Top Gear against Clarkson, base jumping off. Top the Gear was before the Everest movie, a couple of years before. Um, and I'd done a few other bits and pieces of of television as well, and then uh, and then that movie came about. Yeah. So, and was that a shock to get Top Gear than a movie and things like that? I mean, was that ever on the radar that your climbing career might take you into that world? Uh, it, it wasn't by design, but. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm a firm believer in taking the opportunities that 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 come your way, and uh, um, and the Top Gear thing was, uh, you know, that was cool. A researcher, really kind of junior person from Top Gear, rang me up, and I know now that that's what researchers do. They just call anybody up that's got something interesting going on, and they wanted to race a car against a climber. And I was like, well, that's going to be a pretty crap race because. <laughs> You know, climbing is really slow. Even yeah. climbing, it's it's very slow, and there's not that many places where you can drive a car to the bottom and to the top. And I couldn't see how it would be a, you know, even with a bit of TV magic, I couldn't see how it was going to be a a competitive race. And it was not long after I got into base jumping. I, I, I had only been jumping for about eighteen months, and I thought, well, hang on a minute. You know, base jumping is fast. Um, so if we could find somewhere where you could do a you know, race up and back down, it might sort of level the playing fields a bit. They loved that idea because obviously base jumping is pretty spectacular. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then uh, and then me and my mate Tim Emmett, we, we, we traveled the world and particularly Europe and North America looking for somewhere where you might be able to to do a, a, a reasonably legit competition somewhere with a car park at the bottom and a, and a road at the top. And yeah, we found somewhere the Verdon Gorge and uh, and it was sick, you know. They uh, Top Gear was one of the most popular TV shows in the world back in two thousand and five. It, it really was, and they pulled out all the stops. And it was a well resourced shoot with some of the best people in the in the business. And it's um, it still holds up, you know. It's it's a good bit of telly. It's on it, YouTube. <laughs> I watched it again last night. It definitely holds up. And you're a, you're a young laddie there. You're not you're you're young, and you know you're you're up for that climb. Yeah, yeah, it was ace. You know the uh, and and then that did. Um, you know, other opportunities came from it, not least of all, Tim and I got sponsored by Audi and managed to get lots of points on my license <laughs> and, and, and get a taste for fast cars, which was, uh, you know, n- not necessarily a great thing. Um, but was again, that it wild, was, was that the wild time in your book? Yeah, that was the, that was part of the wild times. Yeah, for sure. That and the base jumping, you know, the uh, and a bunch of other stuff, uh, a lot of partying and climbing big walls. Um in less faraway places, more like, you know, Yosemite. And th- it was a good time. The noughties was a, a really amazing time in Yosemite. I spent every autumn and, and quite a few springs there for a whole decade and um, made a lot of friends. And it really was cool. You know, it was it was pre-internet. Um, or it wasn't pre-internet, but it was, it was certainly pre-smartphones and, and pre-social yeah. media. And I remember there wasn't even cell phone signal in Yosemite until well into the 2000s and you didn't even get a mobile phone signal on el cap until like 2006 or something so it, we just it, it was a sort of different time um no one was free climbing on el cap it, it, everyone was so late to that party there was about half a dozen of us who had the best cliff in the world and a bunch of aid climbers tapping around on it <laughs> and it was uh it was ace and they they, they were the wildest times um but the Top Gear thing was another eye opener about filmmaking and about how, uh, you know, the it, it is a real game of smoke and mirrors to try and produce 
the level of the production value of British television is really high. We kind of take it for granted because you don't really see anything else. You see Hollywood. Yeah. Now you've got all the big streamers, Netflix and stuff, but it, it's really good in terms of production value, in terms of how polished and professional it is. You go to Spain or, or Argentina and you watch what goes on telly and, it, and it's, it's rough, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, it's, it's not the yeah. same. Um, but there's also like a level of, um, of falsehood, especially in adventure television. It's not, it's a bit different now, but, you know, it's all this false jeopardy and, and kind of like, dun, 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 what happens next? Oh, I'm about to die. Well, no, you're not. You, you're just doing another <laughs> scene for your TV show that happens every time. Um, and then back then in like the late 2000s, the, the, other, the flip side to that coin was that the real hardcore stuff, the real expedition movies, the guys doing badass shit in faraway places, we're making crap films, you know, there was, the level of cinematography was really low and you really weren't, you just didn't engage with the story in the same way. So after those experiences on, on Top Gear and, and Everest, which were both very different, you know, the Everest, we did, we did climb Everest, but, you know, Everest, is, even then it wasn't what people think. It's, it's this huge kind of, I don't know what it is, and I, and I don't like to speak ill of it, but it's like, it's not mountaineering, you know, and it, it's not climbing. It's just this weird game that the high altitude, you know, Doug Scott used to call it high altitude tourism, which is a bit harsh, but it, it is. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to try and like bring some of this production value, this really like high end filmmaking to a, a much more hardcore um, expedition where there's, you know, there's not loads of false jeopardy and, and and hyped up risk it's it's legit there's like hardcore people who know what they're doing without a massive off-camera army of people helping out and stepping in if anything goes wrong but try to make something that looks as good as top gear and uh and i teamed up with a guy called alistair lee who i met at the kendall martin film festival um and saw one of his films called storms which was really good incredibly niche and i i could see that he had the kind of talent to do something and yeah, we made the, the first big film that um, that was kind of, uh, you know, my project, which which is called the As Asgard Project, and that was two thousand nine, and uh, yeah, we killed it. It's, uh, uh, it was ace. You know, we <laughs> we went on a proper hardcore mission. Loads of stuff went wrong. Nobody died, and uh, we came back with like what I think is a really good film. And and again, it still stands up pretty well. It sounds like with with the olden days Yosemite, when you were saying there was no social media and internet and uh, phone lines and things, you do you long for those days? Do, 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 you, do you miss those days or like having a film crew right beside you now and being able to be instantly on Instagram updating people on what you're doing? It, you've you've no, I'm not into it. I, I, I don't really like social media. No, I uh, I think it detracts from the experience, and I think there's a lot of people out there who are only doing it for that and. Yeah, it gives you a chance to monetize it and do it, but I think that's always always on Insta feed um, does detract from from the experience. I also think that um, it's highly addictive, and uh, and I think it's it's pretty dark. <laughs> and uh, I, I was I've getting got, that got, vibe for you. I've got and you've got held back. Yeah, I've got a daughter who's nine years old, and uh, I, I just think that you know it's not it's not all bad. Um, you can find some inspiration there, but I think. I think there's a lot of bad things about it. And um, I think we're all like addicted to it. It's the new smoking, isn't it? Like no one smokes anymore, but everyone's stuck on the screens. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's a shame. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I do think it was better back in the day where you didn't have a, a, a an always on internet connection. When you went to the mountains and you were hanging on a beeline and you were uncomfortable, you just had to sit there and be uncomfortable <laughs> and smoke cigarettes instead of scrolling. See, but my daughter's eight. She's nine next month. Do you worry about your kids getting exposed to social media and and what the world is like out there once their their friends are going to have it? Maybe maybe before your kids and stuff like that, and then they'll be asking for it. Do you I mean, it's that? the world in which we live, isn't it? So you can't fight the tide. But I, yeah, I do. I think uh, I think it's a, a real issue in the modern world, and I think that um, you know, yeah, people. There's lots of benefits to it as well. Don't get me wrong. Like. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly, uh, you know, I don't know how we used to do it. How the hell did we used to like live without the internet and always on connections and and dealing? But I do think that social media is, you know, highly addictive. And I think it's really bad for um, self worth, and and I, I think it's more bad than good, to be honest. Um, 
but you know it's uh, it's it's part of the world in which we live it's learning to manage it not get rid of it and it's also extremely commercially valuable it, it, it there's no question that yeah uh, social marketing helps sell stuff and and it's it's a part of the world in which we live and, and do you enjoy that? I know you, you'd prefer to be out in the adventures and with your kids and things like that, but that side of it, obviously the brands look at you, uh, such a, a well-known relationship with Berghouse and things like that. Do you enjoy that side of it, that world that, that is marketing and you showing the products and being out there using? I think I like sharing adventures. You know, I like, I like I, I'm very aware that most people never get to do this kind of stuff. And when I was a kid, it's what I dreamed of doing. And, uh, and particularly film and particularly of a, of a, a reasonable production value. Um, you know, you, climbing, you can't make, it's not like some sports like surfing or skiing or base jumping where you really can just stick a GoPro on your helmet, press record, and a minute later, you'll have something that you can stick online and it'll be amazing. It doesn't work like that. Climbing's slow and jerky. And um, it, it's hard to capture the, the beauty of the mountains and the whole sort of essence of what climbing mountains is and the, and the suffering and the, the the pain juxtaposed against the joy and the and the wonder it's um it's much more difficult to make high quality especially with a story with a, a narrative um and it's been a real privilege working with people like Alistair um and Matt Pycroft from Cold House and a few other people to try and like let other people share what it is that why we do it you know where, where you go and it's it's a huge challenge to to come back with a, a good film of a proper expedition it's half the challenge any of these big trips would have been half as much effort if you hadn't tried to to capture it well um and i get a kick out of that because you know it's most people will never see the the, the jungle of mount Roraima or, or the or you know the nunatuks of of, of antarctica or the these giant cliffs in faraway places it costs a fortune to get there you need a lot of skills and a lot of time and mates with the same kind of privilege um to be able to do it and they are the most epic you know they're just the most spectacular inspiring powerful landscapes you, you can imagine so i enjoy that side to it and uh you know it, thanks to people like berghaus and various other brands not only do they make the kit which means you can go and enjoy those landscapes but you know you need budget to to get to those places and you need budget to to come back with the goods to to show other people about them well that's it and let's let's go to house of gods because obviously kit budget adventure through the jungle take us there and then take us to how did amazon prime come around and was that agreed at the start or did you have to make it and then get the pitch out there how is that all no, it, none of the big films I've made have been to commission because it's just so hard to to get um, a, a commission, like a, a signed contract with a streamer or a TV channel for something which has so much genuine jeopardy. It's not like, you know, they're not going to give you a big fat check to go off and maybe not come back with a film because there's so much uncertainty in a real expedition. That's why they like the formulaic, you know, pretend adventure where... It, it, they know they're going to get a TV show. If they give you a million bucks, they know they're going to get six parts and there's going to be all kinds of exciting stuff happen, but there's not going to be a, an absolute failure. Whereas when you go on a proper mission, there is a chance that you won't come back with a film. You know, there's a chance you won't get to the top. The, the House of the Gods, we airdropped all the stuff at the back of a little plane into the jungle with a jerry rigged parachute and locator beacon system. There was a pretty reasonable chance that we just wouldn't find it, <laughs> um, that, you know, and that was everything. That was all the gear for a 40 day expedition um, out of the back of a plane into the jungle with an untested um, parachute and, and located beaker system. Um, and it worked, it worked a treat. We, we found everything a week later beneath the cliff. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to describe, um, just how spectacular these places are you know i i do get a kick out of extreme landscapes and uh, uh but i also i like climbing big rocks uh, and i find that like that technical challenge as well as uh, a journey in a, in a in a in a remote landscape is really for the last 10 years and still now that's what motivates me the most by far 
Um, and, you know, Mount Roraima, the greatest of all the Tapuis. Tapui means house of the gods in the local language. And it's, yeah, it just looks like something out of a fantasy. You, you've seen it, you know, it just doesn't look real. And it's way out there. It's 100K. The trek in is 100 kilometers through the jungle. That is far. Um, and then you've got this 2,000 foot high, fully overhanging wall covered in tarantulas and, you know, waterfalls cascading down off it just the the logistics of moving all the stuff around is complex and involved and then when you get to the meat on the bone it's it's a proper thing you know it's like it, it looked desperate it ended up being quite a lot easier than it looked but you know there's it's twice the size of any cliff in the uk and, and incredibly overhanging and then this time having done a fair amount of big cliffs in faraway places i very much by design um added in a couple of elements you know we there was a young girl from the lake district anna taylor who'd never been on a big trip before she'd never been on a big route before um she was extremely green but a good climber a solid trad climber and, and done some impressive stuff around here and reminded me a bit of myself from 25 years ago and um so we gave her an opportunity to come and join the ride um and then even better than that was the uh the two local boys boys that live in a village underneath right the closest village where we landed the plane it's called philippi uh, in fact my mate waldo's there right now um and you know one of them edward he's he was 56 years old and he'd spent his whole life in that like basin beneath the mountain and on clear days you could see this thing and i've been to guyana before and i know that they speak english there it's the only english-speaking country in south america and i know that they're switched on fit strong intelligent people and Waldo Etherington, my uh, my good friend who runs a company called Remote Ropes, is um, is one of the most badass knot ninjas and and rope ninjas you you'll ever meet. And he's trained hundreds and even thousands of people in the basics you need for actually tree climbing, but for climbing ropes. I was, for, for I was going to say he's a specialist, a specialist tree climber, isn't he? Yeah, but the um, but the rope skills of tree climbing are, are very applicable to big wall climbing. It, it's pretty simple. You just need to learn how to juma and absorb and lower out. Um, but he's he's used to run these scientific projects in um, uh, in the jungles, and he would get a, a cohort of students every week um, and start off with right. This is a carabiner. This is a screw gate. This is a harness. So he's got a really systematic process to to teach people how you climb ropes. And then he's still getting used to the scale of big cliffs, but the systems are the same. It's just uh, bigger. So yeah, we brought these two local guys, Edward and Troy, um, and we trained them up and we brought them up the wall with us, which, you know, nobody, that's like, no one does that. It's, it's, it, it was hard. It was challenging to, there was eight of us on the cliff. So we're making a film as well. We're climbing the first ascent of a majorly overhanging cliff in an extreme and wet environment. We airdropped all the shit in and might not be even be able to find it. Um, and then we've got three basically beginners with us on, on the wall. Um, and, you know, eight people, you have to bring all your water up, up the cliff. You, you, don't, you never climb as an eight because it's such a ball egg. And half the team were, were very green, but we made it all work. Uh, Waldo and another guy called Wilson Cutbirth, who was uh, who was my main climbing partner. We kind of, uh, you know, managed the whole scene and everyone had their role um, within it. And it, it was absolutely brilliant. You know, in many ways, that was kind of one of the most rewarding trips because it it felt like really, you know, sharing the love of it. Um, still an extreme challenge, but it, it was so cool getting these two, you know, they call themselves Amerindians. Um, these two local guys, like tribal indigenous uh native people on on their cliff it was it was ace and they absolutely loved it they just didn't stop laughing and joking and smiling all the way to the top how how do you operate obviously in that instance you're you're looking at that like like the captain like you you're in charge of that you've got your own safety to look after what is the pressure like on you when you're actually you've got anna there you've got waldo you've got the two locals let alone a camera crew film crew there's a lot of pressure on you there yeah um there is and uh and it's like uh it's it's um it's complicated you know just constantly it, assessing the risks and trying to stay on top of it and uh, and figuring out what the what's around the corner trying to second guess what's going to happen next and what you're going to need and um but to be honest that one it went like clockwork it was unbelievable it was a really really complicated mission with a lot of different sections and moving parts 
Um, and it, and it just went like, and anything that didn't go according to plan had been planned for. So, uh, yeah. so it was, uh, it was almost a bit disappointing, like a good disaster makes for a much better film. And, uh, uh, you know, as an expedition leader, the last thing you want is any drama. You want to like preempt any drama and remove any drama from, from the situation because that can lead to, you know, failure or bad things happening. Um, but as a director, as a producer, as a filmmaker, you want drama. You know, you want like high jeopardy. You want shit to go wrong. You want near misses at every turn. Um, so there's kind of these like opposing uh, hats where, uh, but the expedition one leads out every time. You know, it, it, this stuff's full on. It's, I'm I'm a bit nervous because I've had a really incredible streak of uh, a success. Um, or certainly like, uh, you know, we haven't managed. Not all the trips have been successful in that we haven't achieved what we set out to do, which is usually to try and free climb um, some giant cliff in the middle of nowhere. But we've pretty much got to the top of all of them, base jumped off a bunch of them, made good films on all of them, uh, and more importantly than that, there hasn't been any, not even yeah, there's been a few minor things, but no serious sort of uh, mishaps or injuries or worse. And um, I've done about a dozen of these expeditions now and I'm kind of thinking, oh my God, you know, like <laughs> you, sooner or later, something's going to happen. Even if no mistakes are made, you just, you, you start, there's been plenty of near misses. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit nervous that I'm due a spectacular failure or a major incident on a, on a forthcoming trip. Hopefully not. Hopefully not, not, especially not if it's a kid's one. Well, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, just, well, I was going to say stay safe, but what you do is it's kind of, well, that, that's something I, I heard you say. You you don't ride a road bike because that's more dangerous than base jumping. Well, I think so. You know, the, uh, the there's less uncontrollable elements of risk in the base jump. Whenever it goes wrong, base jumping, it's pilot error. It's uh, It's a mistake made by... The part the participant me um road biking it's all the other dickheads on the road you know it's all the the hgvs the the people on their phones that you know I, yeah. I, I genuinely think the objective hazard of uh of riding a road bike is you know it's like wandering around under a serac it's it's it, you can't you're not in control of the risks um whereas up to a certain point less so in in snowy mountains um there's there's a lot of risks you can manage and you know, that's kind of the more sort of inherent risk there is in the in the activity, in the climb anyway, the, the more careful you have to be and the more you have to like not chance it. And it, I, I'm a very different person to the one I was when I was 16, 17 years old, first exploring the, the Clamberis Pass and, you know, soloing and, uh, and running it out and kind of cutting corners um, because you can get away with it for a certain amount of time. But as you take on larger and larger challenges with more and more unavoidable risks you kind of have to minimize the ones that that you can uh, and just exposure you know just the more time you you roll the dice the more times you spin the barrel and pull the trigger the, the more chances there are of, uh, of there being a bullet in it well that's and an, just tell me if, it, if it's not something you want to discuss but um losing stanley in his accident how much did that change your career yeah, that massively uh, affected me when, uh, you know, Sean Leary, his nickname was Stanley. He was one of my best mates, um, one of my main partners for the those big times when we kind of, you know, we knew each other from the wild times, but then amped it up and started doing some really sort of monumental stuff together. Um, but the timing of his death, he crashed his wingsuit into a cliff proximity flying, you know, do, doing something incredibly dangerous. Um, but my little girl, my firstborn was was six months old she was a tiny baby and his wife was seven months pregnant at the time so if he'd have died a year earlier um it would have still hit me pretty hard but in a, in a fundamentally different way um because I wasn't a parent and he wasn't about to be a parent and as you know when that kind of element comes into your life you know people say oh, has it changed your attitude towards risk well you'd have to be a bit of a knob for it not to right because uh you know, they, there's a reason they call them dependencies. And it's not just the children, it's your partner, it's your other half, the mother. She needs help as well, especially in those early years. So um, so it was such a disaster when when Stanley went in like that. And it, it just, uh, it really made me question everything I'd ever felt about about dangerous fun and 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 sort of living your dreams. And 
and you know writing this book last year I did really I'd always I've always thought quite deeply about these things but I really sort of contemplated it on, on another level like, like why do you do this why do I personally do this what are the attractions and unquestionably a part of it is the risk you know it's that's it's the danger that makes it so exciting that excitement and danger are, in my opinion two sides of the same coin and if you remove the risk and you remove all the danger then it's not as much fun anymore um but then how how do you reconcile that with you know being a responsible parent well that's a tricky one <laughs> but uh, well, how can you how can you it's a difficult one and i mean this respectfully how can you ever say to your kids don't do that that's too dangerous when they say come on dad we've seen what you've done when they get a bit older and they watch your movies but then on the flip side of that i've spoken to p- people like aldo kane and things like lowering himself into volcanoes and this but he's he's almost like you touched on earlier predicted everything that can go wrong and is prepared is so prepared for the danger that you are about to take on or anyone like that is about to take on that if you can get your kids, if they go down that route of adventure to that level of preparation, maybe as a dad and, and, and your wife will be a bit easier when the kids get into these things. Yes, you know, ultimately, uh, who knows? I mean, clearly they, they, our kids are um, pro- probably will have uh, an appetite for adventure. Who knows how far they'll take those things. But, you know, giving them the skills and the knowledge to uh, to, like, and not make all those stupid mistakes. I, th- I think the most dangerous part of my career was probably very early on where, you know, you're, you're all, all balls, no brains, and, and you're really kind of going for it without um, without thinking it through properly and without the, the reference points and the skills and the knowledge to and the equipment to, um, to do it in a more sort of educated way. Um, and, you know, hopefully if you you can teach people how to do it right. And then in some ways, some of the stuff I've been doing in recent years is the most hardcore stuff I've ever done by, by quite a long way, but I feel like I'm doing it with a higher margin of, uh, of safety than the stuff that came 10 or 20, or even I hate to say, you know, nearly 30 years ago now. Um, Yeah, no, I I get it. Do you ever see yourself on the other side of the camera and, Correct me, sorry if you have done that already, but like Cold House or a Jimmy Chin or something like that, and been there for another adventure because you've 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 been the star, the adventure, the the focal point. Is that something you would look at to create your own movies and and go down that route? Um, possibly, you know, and I kind of I, I do have a foot on both sides of the camera on all of these projects. You know, there's okay. I always work with other people, but I kind of direct and produce as well uh less on the technical side but uh, I, I have a lot to do with the uh both sides of the camera um however when it comes to more the like the technical stuff I, I i do take photographs um i wouldn't call myself a photographer but i've got a good camera and a small arsenal of lenses and when you go to nice places and do exciting stuff it's not that hard to get really good photos um but i i don't have a passion for um being inside a camera to be behind it to be the, the technical side to it. I find this weird thing where when you put the lens to your eye you take yourself out of the moment and and I, and I find it a really weird kind of uh, dichotomy and it's part of the reason I don't like social media and even photography you you're no longer there you, you, you t- it's you know it's the whole you're trying to capture what you're experiencing in that moment for a future moment and by doing so, you, you know, on some sort of cosmic level, you, you, you spoil it. <laughs> you take yourself out of the, uh, out of the moment, out of the situation, and uh, and you're no longer in it. And um, you know, it's something I've I've battled with for for many years because as a professional, it's a big part of the the monetizing of this stuff is coming back with the goods to to share. And um, but. Uh, you know, I, I usually get enough, but there's always, uh, I do like to save in the moments. Like I like to just not yeah. capture it, just, just be there and do it. Um, there's and, a, a uh, great, a, you maybe saw, I don't know if you follow basketball or know about LeBron James in the NBA. He broke the uh, scoring record last week in the NBA, the most points ever scored. And this really famous photo just last week, he's taken his shot 
and obviously everyone in the crowd, there's cameras everywhere. But in the front row, there's this older gentleman, white hair, in a suit, just sitting there watching. And it's, did you see it? It's um, I didn't, but yeah, he was the only Phil one Knight. who actually saw it's, it. <laughs> it's Phil Knight, the guy that founded Nike. That, that's who's there. He's taking in the moment. And it was, it's a great photo that will go down yeah, yeah. in history. Yeah. He just, he probably knows that he'll just look at his friend's camera tomorrow and get the picture. And, but he was yeah. in the moment. And it's becoming more and more rare, you know. But it, you know, it's a, it's a double edged sword. I've just spent last week in uh, in Norway kite skiing in this cool place called the Hard Angavida, and uh, I haven't launched a kite since I finished the Spectre expedition across Antarctica, which was five years ago. And um, you know, I kind of uh, I was sick of doing cold trips and uh, and wanted to do some more rock climbing. And then. I went out to Norway to reconnect with some old friends out there and uh, and, and get back on it. And man, it's fun, man. Kite, kite skiing is sick. It's really, there's so much power in, in those things and you can travel at such speed over such distance into really wild areas. Um, and after like, I, I didn't shoot anything at all. And I was like, oh man, I really should like uh, um, capture some of this because it's you know a it's it's magical and it's a cool thing to share and b you know I'm, I'm a professional so you you need to um and I got this new camera one of those 360 into 360 things which actually worked really well um because kiting is a really difficult thing to to film because it's such high pace you're on the move it's there's a lot of shaking around there's a lot it's cold there's um it, it's actually a complete nightmare to film but I'm really glad I did because it although you know, I had like five days of just blasting and then I was like, okay, let's try and capture this. And it was quite frustrating getting like everything to line up, but we got some, we got some dynamite. There was a, a really cool section and then you get to like relive it. So although I, I do find it a bit, um, takes you out the moment when you're shooting it, there's something wonderful about being able to, to relive it. Uh, and especially when you get like good stuff, like really professional, high quality stuff. Cause it's, it's a different thing to just, some shitty shaky footage on a phone or something i, I did enjoy when we first started uh, messaging back and forth and you said nashi i can't next week because i'm always kite surfing and all that i was like yes of course he is of course he's doing something like that it's awesome here i'm conscious of time and as, as, we're, as we've talked about throughout this we're both dads and when the kids are sleeping it's our dad time we get to chill out how's the rest of the year anything planned is a summer holiday with the kids is it all booked or what's it's all coming together yeah the uh i i'm uh, I'm going, I think I'm going to go back to Baffin Island um, later in the, the year, which uh, is not 100% yet. Um, but another big thing I'm working towards is uh, I'm going to take the kids out of school for a year. My wife and I, Jessica. Uh, wow. Yeah, um, because, you know, they're only little ones and there's so many places I'd like to show them and things I'd like to do. There just isn't enough time in the summer holidays. So uh, so next year, next academic school year, um, so like summer 24 we're going to uh we're going to go on a big mission and um so i'm kind of like in trying to think of all the coolest places i've ever been um uh, and and places i've always wanted to go and uh, embrace like a major world tour and uh, and do some some sick stuff with the kids and people at burghouse will be saying leo please remember to take a photo please remember yeah yeah we somewhere. will we definitely will <laughs> I've actually we well, made we made a little film with the kids uh, last summer and I just got the rough cut through a couple of days ago um, and it's ace you know it's it's really good I think in some ways it's one of the best films I've ever made because uh, it's just got this other element which makes it so much uh, more relatable and um, you know not everybody's a climber not everybody has a, a passion for adventure and, and wild places but a hell of a lot of people um, share the the adventure of, of parenthood so. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it's called two point four. <laughs> okay, um, it, it, it'll be we, out pretty we, soon. Will you have a go at homeschooling the kids when you're traveling the world? Will you yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll um, we will. We'll uh, they they won't miss anything on the education because you know as we all found in in lockdown, the uh, you can pretty much fit a full like a, a full day of schooling into like two or three hours when it's one on one, um, which frees up the rest of the day for doing other stuff. I like it. Good on you. Wait until my wife hears this. She will, she'll be going for the same idea. Leo, a pleasure. Thank you. I am hopefully maybe catch up again in November. Kendall Mountain Festival, if you're there again. Yeah, almost uh, certainly. Thanks for uh, pinning me down, Nashi. And um, yeah, 
All the best with the family adventures. Yeah, you too. All the best, Leo. Thank you.